Praise the Lord. I'm thankful to be uh, in His presence again with, with the Word before you all. Uh, I trust that God is uh, keeping us all safe and healthy. Um, let us turn to Acts chapter 18. Sorry, I meant to say 19. Cha- Acts chapter 19. So I'm going to read. Oh. I'm going to read uh, verses 20 through 23. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. After these things were ended, Paul purposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. So he went into Macedonia, two of them. He sent into Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him, Timotheus and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a season. And there, at the same time, there arose no small stir about that way. So, Paul is now in Ephesus, after having passed and spent a long period of time in Macedonia and other places, and he's now in a place called Ephesus, as Minu uh, spoke about um, last time, how it was a seat of um, a lot of uh, pagan worship and trade and commerce. It was kind of a uh, central place. And so Paul is having sent people on to uh, check on the churches in Macedonia. Uh, he sent t- uh, Timothy and a person called Erastus. Paul has stayed back in uh, Ephesus. He eventually wanted to go to um, back to Jerusalem, which is what we'll see about in the coming few weeks because the last uh, few chapters of Acts is about how Paul makes it back to Jerusalem. He gets captured, and all of these things will cover in the coming few weeks. So I was going to finish out chapter 19 today. Uh, picking up from where Minus uh, spoke last time, if you remember, uh, he was covering the topic of how um, the sons of Sceva and how they tried to uh, cast out a demon in Paul's, uh, in the God, the name of the God that Paul serves, and the demon overpowered those people and said, I know God and I know Paul, but who are you? Well, so he spoke about those things and and then uh, we, we covered this topic of how people, when they repented, they brought all their, uh, you know, their books and the things that they did witchcraft with and all these things that served other gods and they burned them and it was very uh, expensive things. And then, um, so it says that the God, word of God mightily grew in these places. Uh, even though it was a seat of idol worship, and all kinds of demon, uh, demonic activity, the word of Guru was not hindered uh, by those things. In fact, they could not withstand the power of the word of God and the power of the Spirit that worked so mightily uh, through Paul and the others that were with him. So we're in this uh, scene, and then so now Paul is staying back in Ephesus. He sent these close companions that were with him, sent them on to Macedonia. Now he's staying back in Ephesus. And unbeknownst to him, um, there was something working in the background that he he wasn't aware of at the time. So sometimes, you know, we go about our day, uh, we do the things that we're supposed to do, and things kind of develop that uh, ends up being problems for us or headaches or puts us in real trouble, and we may not know how that gets started or stirred up, and we have no hand in that, but some things uh, get stirred up the same way Paul was just in this place. And so there was a man in verse 24, his name was Demetrius. So his job was to make little idols, or I mean, little or big, whatever. Um, 
and he was a silversmith. So he made idols for uh, Diana. And, and he brought a lot of profit, you know, so there were several people that did this, right? And they brought a lot of profit uh, by doing this trade, and they, they made idols out of silver. Interestingly, the people who uh, sold their uh, witchcraft books earlier, they got 50,000 pieces of silver. Uh, I mean, it was 50,000 pieces of silver worth of treasures that they burned in the fire. So it was that treasure that uh, these, uh, these silversmiths were using to make idols. Okay, so, um, and so anyway, so this Demetrius, he heard about Paul and he already saw how it is causing people to change from worshipping these idols, uh, who Diana was the powerful uh, goddess there, and the goddess that the Ephesians worshipped, and the, there was a big uh, temple of Diana, which was actually one of the seven wonders of the world uh, in Ephesus, and, uh, and everybody came all over to see and worship Diana in this temple. So, so these people, had, there's this whole system around uh, that worship of this goddess, uh, that people earn money around this, right? So people, there are idol makers who made money, and when they heard about Paul, especially this Demetrius, um, he he's like, okay, uh-oh, if this continues, I might lose my way of making profit. And so he stirred up other people like him who do this thing, and they started stirring up um, you know, and he's saying, you know, in verse 26, he says, you know, it's not just in Ephesus, throughout all Asia, this Paul, he takes in my name because Paul is now famous, um, and they heard about him, and this Paul has persuaded, I'm in Acts 19, verse 26, this Paul has persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. He's actually saying uh, the things that Paul is preaching, so he knows very well what Paul stands for. So, you know, it's a good thing that people know where we stand, right? That when in the people we interact with, the people we uh, fellowship with, that they know who we serve and what we stand for. So these, even though these people probably never knew Paul firsthand, knew what he stood for, right? It is a blessing and it is our responsibility that people know who we are that we serve this living God, and, and that's how what they know about us. So anyway, so he said they create this, and then they make it about that, you know, they, you know, you know all these big trouble always starts in the small little fire, right, spark. And so he started the spark and made it into a big fire, and he said, what, um, our whole, uh, you know, profession is in danger because of this gospel that Paul is preaching. Not only that, he kind of just, you know, to help himself, he made it about this temple of the goddess of Diana, right? He's saying, not only that, uh, it, he, he's accusing Paul and saying that, oh, Paul is saying that this great goddess should be despised and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worships. So when we Stand against and they caught. Two of Paul's companions, they didn't catch Paul, but they caught two people who were with Paul. Um, his, their names were Gaius and Aristarchus, and they brought him. They brought, so the whole city is now gathered together, and they brought them to the middle of this, uh, it says theater, could have been where they, uh, the magistrates were. And they brought them, and all these people started coming and yelling at each other. It's like a football game, right? People are yelling. And screaming, and you can't even hear yourself think. And it says that one people, were, one side was yelling about one thing about Diana, and the other uh, side of the assembly was was uh, yelling about something else. 
And it says a big part of the assembly didn't even know what the problem was. But they were just there because they heard there was something going on. And and looked like there was going to break out this big riot or confusion or trouble. And then they brought the magistrates. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the details because I want to get to the point of my message. And eventually, uh, uh, somebody stood up and said, hold on a second. These people that you caught, they didn't do anything wrong. They didn't rob anybody. They didn't disobey any laws. And, and uh, if Demetrius has a problem with any of these things, let him come and pursue this in the court and follow the procedures. And so people appreciated that and then just kind of just calmed down and the problem just went away on its own and everybody was dismissed. Okay? So this is the story. But well, there's a little verse in between, in verse 30. When they took Paul's companions, and it says, Paul would have entered into the people, but the disciples suffered him not. So Paul, and knowing Paul, we know what we know about him, he was ready to jump into that. Try to not, probably not to have his companions bear the brunt of the problem. He wanted to jump in and, you know, and maybe try to fix the situation or try to resolve it or whatever. He was going to get into the middle of this trouble and the people had to kind of stop him, right? Thank God for people that sometimes that we have in our lives that say, hold on, just don't go jump into these things, right? And so thank God for the people we have in our lives that try to calm us down from, prevent us from doing things that may not be necessary, right? The same way Paul, if he had gone there, it would be like throwing gasoline into the fire, right? He would have just made an even bigger problem when God worked through those people and, this, and protected Paul and the whole situation calmed down on its own, Right? Yes? So my point today is, you know, there are things that might come into our lives that create trouble or problems or, uh, or confusion. And sometimes we think, how did this even happen? I don't have a say in this. Why am I in this trouble? Why are these things happening to me? I don't have any control over this. And we don't know how to handle ourselves in this situation. And... And just like here with Paul, maybe people, will, God will send people into your lives and say, hold on brother or sister, stay calm. God is working on your behalf. God is doing a thing that will resolve the thing that you're dealing with. Be still and know that I am God. In these moments that we're heart is troubled and stirred up, and so overwhelmed that we don't know why this, there are certain things are happening to us. Things are beyond our control and things are being propagated or, 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 or stirred up without our, even our knowledge in whatever situation, whether it's in our family or with our friendships or with our relationships or with our, in our workplace. And things beyond our control. And sometimes God is saying, hold on. You don't need to get yourself in that situation. Just do what you're supposed to be doing. I will take care of it. Amen? You all with me? So there's a story in the Old Testament that reminded me, <coughs> I was reminded of. It's in 2 Kings chapter 18 and 19. I don't want to read it. But it's a story of a king, Hezekiah. Okay, so, and it says, uh, 2 Kings 18 starts with, um, how Hezekiah was such a faithful king that it even says there was not a, any king like him after that. He burned down the idols and he was, uh, you know, he was a follower of the righteousness of God and he lived as a good king. Even this, just like Paul. He was doing all the things that God wanted him to do. He, Hezekiah was. And without him doing anything, this Assyrian king 
who Assyria was kind of conquering and defeating many nations around them, were now came and knocking on the doorstep of Judah, which is God's people, right? He, they, so this king sent, um, sent these, his uh, leaders of his army to send a message to Hezekiah and said, you better listen up. I, my king has conquered all these nations around you. Okay? What do you think you can do in front of my army? You think you can trust in your God to save you from my army which I've defeated? And he even told the people, the messengers told the people, and they said, uh, they spoke in uh, Hebrew, and they told, spoke it out aloud, and he said, your king Hezekiah is going to tell you, you can trust in the Lord your God to save you from us, but don't believe him. There's going to be people whispering us or thing, whispering in our ears that we see when we face the situations that is going to speak to us these lies that say, is God really powerful to save us from these situations? Whatever you might be facing today or in the future. They, these things might speak to us and say, can God really save you out of this? Surely God doesn't even care for us. Surely God is too busy to worry about our little problems. That's what this Assyrian army was messengers were telling the people of Judah at the time. Don't even go there. Don't think that the Lord your God can save you from the situation. And that's when uh, Hezekiah went to God. I mean, it's a long story. Uh, if you read 2 Kings 18 and 19, you can get all the details. And Hezekiah came first. He, God spoke to Hezekiah through Isaiah. Uh, well, Hezekiah sent people to Isaiah, the prophet, and God spoke to them through Isaiah and said, God is going to save you. Don't worry about it. Okay, he, has, he, didn't, he didn't rebuke you. He was blaspheming my name, right? He didn't attack you. He attacked me. See, when people attack us, they're attacking the God we serve. Amen? So he's saying, trust, trust, in, trust in me. But that was not enough for Hezekiah. So sometimes, you know, when God sends, you know, through our spiritual mentors or leaders speak to us, Sometimes it's not enough. It doesn't quite satisfy us. Right? We're still uh, worried and upset. And, and that's natural. Right? Sometimes we're overwhelmed. And we don't know how to deal with the situation. Right? So then Hezekiah went to the temple. And he prayed before God in 2 Kings chapter 19. He himself. So don't. Yes, I mean, it's wonderful to have great men of God, women of God, and family in our lives to comfort us and strengthen us in our time of need. But that should not be at the expense of we ourselves going to God. Don't uh, delegate uh, your responsibility to other people. Right? We need all these things to strengthen us. But that is not replacing our responsibility to come to God ourselves. Amen? Our relationship is with God himself. Yes? We have the authority and the privilege to come to God and come before his presence and be overwhelmed and place that before him and say, God, I don't know how to deal with this situation. I didn't put myself in it. If I did something wrong, forgive me, but I, I don't know how, what the answer is. I don't know how to deal with it. These things, these forces are too powerful for me. I don't know what to do. That's when God responds. That's what Hezekiah did. He came to God and he said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwells between the cherubims, thou art God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. Lord, bow down thine ear and hear. Open, Lord, thine eyes and see. And hear the words of Sennacherib, which is the king of Assyria, which is sent to reproach the living God. 
So God responded through Isaiah to Hezekiah. When he himself came, the king came before God's presence. God responded. He didn't shake his... He said, Assyria did not rebuke you. They blasphemed my name. It was me that they insulted. And I will answer. You just need to stand still and wait for me to work. And we know what happened is that he didn't have to do anything. When they were sleeping, one angel went and just killed 185,000 soldiers, Assyrian soldiers in one night while Israel slept in peace and safety. God answers his people's prayers. He comes to us in the middle of our trouble and he works on our behalf. No problem is too small or too big for God. He cares for each one of our situations and he comes to us and does things without even us doing anything. And he's... And and they didn't have, when they woke up, the Assyrians that were left, they just went back home. Just like what happened to Paul. Paul, if he had rushed in there, you know, he might have made the situation worse. Hezekiah, if he had sent his army, he might have been defeated and made the situation worse. There are times he wants us to fight. And he'll tell us of those times. But there are times he wants us just to be quiet and wait patiently for his time. To be still before God. And wait for his working of his power. Because God will receive the glory in all these situations. His name will be magnified. And this king was shortly after he himself was killed. The Assyrian king was killed by his own son. If you walk and trust in God, you don't have to worry about anything. God takes care of us. That's why I'm going to worship team, you can come forward. I'm going to end with Psalm 46 that speaks to us. And I've been referring to this uh, verse all throughout. It's, it's this situation. And we can see it time and again in, uh, in Exodus when Moses was before the Red Sea uh, with the Israelites, didn't know there's the army behind them and a big sea in front of them, didn't know what to do. God said, I will fight for you. Be still. Or Jehoshaphat, God told, told him, be still, I will work on your behalf. I will fight this battle for you. The same way God fought, fought the battle for Hezekiah and God fought the battle for Paul. And he fights our battles for us every day and every night. Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. He is present in the midst of our trouble. He's not sleeping. He's not ignoring our prayer. But he's present there in the midst of our trouble. When our heart is broken, our heart is overwhelmed. He is there in the midst of that. Child of God, don't be worried. Therefore, will not we fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake, with the swelling thereof. No matter what is happening around us, things that are beyond our control, things seem overwhelming. No matter if the, all the, think about all the things that happened last year, how God preserved us, that our heart did not fail. He kept us safe and kept us in the palm of His hands. It seemed just like what is saying here, that the mountains were falling down, but we were firm the trust that we have in God because verse 4 and 5 says there is a river there are the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God the holy place of the tabernacles of the most high we are the city of God we are the tabernacles of the most high this is a city that is built by God we you and I we are the temples of God and his water which is the Holy Spirit flows in our midst and makes glad the city of God. That means we can be joyful in the midst of trouble. We can be at peace when things are failing around us. Because the living waters flow through us and through us. We're not overwhelmed by the waters, but the waters flow out from us and comfort 
other people. That's why even though the kingdoms were moved and they uttered their voice, the Lord of hosts is with us. God of Jacob is our refuge. And I'll skip to verse 10 and 11. Be still. Be patient. Be still. Don't jump into every situation that we can't control. Wait for God to direct our path. Be still and know that I am God. Know, as Paul said, I know whom I have believed. My life is in His hand. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Just like God was exalted in all these situations, God will be exalted in our lives when we wait for Him. But when we try to fight our own battles, we might fail. And that's not what God wanted. But if you wait patiently for Him, He will be exalted through our lives. Finally, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. May His name be glorified.